at your own risk. Holy shit, what the fuck is this? SCP <laughs> 20 forecast. Featuring James. They tried to get me to join their Witch Coven. John. This is a role playing a role playing game. Yeah, but explosions always help. Monica. I'm really fucking tired of first level. Kate. I was actually pretty excited because I've never died during a game. This would have been the first time. Steve. Could have dragged him to the muck. It's kind of a lubricant. And Henry. You realize that book would be like the size of a building. Not a small building. It would be a home. Welcome to one d Welcome to 1D Forecast, the podcast about tabletop gaming. It is Monday, September 28th, 2015. We are live to the internet and hosting our episode tonight just for you is myself, Steve, James, Monica, Henry, my little sister Katie, and John will not be joining us tonight. Boo! What's up, everyone? John is lame. He is lame. Ha. Always lame. Today was the last day of our vacation. Henry and I were away for the weekend. We were in Florida, and now we're back, and I'm sunburned. Hooray. Much ouch. When you're sunburned, do you turn the same color as your beard? I actually look like a lobster. It's, It's pretty spectacular. That is fantastic. All right, so uh, we're going to go right into this. So uh, welcome to 1D Forecast's first live recording. Um, we do have a Q&A, um, which we may or may not use, depending on how time goes. Um, tonight's topic is going to be on Powered by the Apocalypse, uh, the rule set, and various games and hacks that have come from that. And... Um, We're just going to go ahead and go right into our news. So, well, actually, no, let's uh, let's do what we usually do. So, uh, starting with Steve. Hey, Steve. Hey, James. Have you been playing anything recently? I have played a little bit of... uh, When we recorded last time, did we have... uh, Well, we we need to mute your mic there, James getting a lot of feedback. All right, there we go. Uh, I think uh, b- between last recording and this one, I think, Henry, you ran another game of uh, um, Exemplars and Eidolons. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong. I think that's correct. All right. Uh, that's really the only thing that I have played. I haven't had a lot of time for uh, getting together. hope to ch- change that at some point. Um, if you're really still enjoying the game, uh, Henry's doing a very good job of... Um, of running things and uh, keeping the game very interesting and responding to uh, our insane quasi-demands as players. Uh, Really good stuff. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned my character build much at all uh, last time. Uh, Exemplars and Eidolons allows you to make very flexible, very, very, very flexible characters, whatever you want, really. I'm playing as an air elemental, uh, and I'm kind of gaining different abilities as... um, as facts about your character as things go on. I was really very surprised that uh, you can gain a new fact every time you level up your character, which allows you to do different little things, stuff about your character. It's really cool. Uh, for example, I've, I've been able to grow my uh, elemental guy. I was um, I could write down a fact about my character is um, I'm made of air, so therefore I don't need to breathe. So I can go underwater or something like that. I don't need to breathe. Um, I say I'm completely made out of air. I float through the air or something like that. And that happens as I level up. And we all float down here. That's sort of the tone of the game sometimes, i got to say. But overall, really great time. Um, Not particularly related to to role-playing games as me playing them, but I noticed um, I've been watching a lot more uh, Twitch, and I noticed that Twitch, uh, along with its numerous, um, numerous... video game, you know, streams, has uh, streams for role-playing games. 
uh, that um, people set up, and you know you can watch somebody play a tabletop game uh, over Twitch, which really surprised me. The the most popular ones are um, kind of a very elaborate uh, setups, and are obvious. Not they don't seem scripted, but it has that sort of like this is a show sort of deal, and it, it was kind of interesting that um, they had that on there. I don't know. That's an avenue of something we could explore sometime, but. Uh, you know, that's a thing. So that's about it for me, unfortunately. I can't say more. Uh, Katie, how about you? What? What? Me? No. Yeah, um, you go ahead. Ah. Well, yes, like Stephen, we've been play. Well, we played a session of Exemplars and Eidolons, or Eidolons, or however you say it. There is much insanity happening there, and it fills me with great joy. Um, another thing I got to do before that, um, my friend Mike up at Indiana University of Pennsylvania set up a board gaming night, so I hauled up a duffel bag full of my board games, such as Boss Monsters and all that sort of fun stuff, and got a couple people there from the gaming club, and got a bit of a 1D4 con connection there. Um, there was uh, one of the people from the club that uh, gamed with us, is his, I guess, regular GM actually ran games at 1D4Con. <laughs> so I'm like, what? No. <laughs> Far up in Pennsylvania, even, you could still get the 1D4Con connection. So that was pretty cool. And we had a lot of fun. I think that's pretty much it. All right. How about you, Henry? Well, I ran Exemplars Needleons. Um, I always like running that. Uh, we should try to play again soon. Um, my weekly fate game is down a player, so we went back to playing Stars Without Number, which we had a long going, a long ongoing campaign uh, that sort of went in hiatus when we had the additional player. So we're back doing that. Uh, that seems to be going well. Um, it's interesting to see people getting back into their characters after a long time off. Uh, so maybe Monica can talk more about that. Um, you think what else? Uh, a lot of my other free time is directed towards getting ready for Metatopia as I'm getting ready to uh, playtest my big mecha game I'm working on there. I'm actually also in the process of uh, getting a guy, commissioning, commissioning a guy to do art for it, so that's sort of exciting and also uh, <laughs> means that I need to make some serious choices about presentation, which I'm not used to doing. As most of my stuff I just make for, you know, home game use. Um, oh, and I ran uh, Through the Breach, the Malifaux RPG, which went really well. Um, uh, I really like the card-based system it has going. Uh, and the only problem with that game is that my two players are in different parts of the state, so we sort of need to have the stars aligned to get to run that regularly. But, so yeah, that, that's what I have gaming-wise on my plate. All right, Monica, how about you? Okay, um, so basically everything everybody else has already said um, I'm involved in, um, but since this is a live on-air game, I guess I'll go through the list of everything I've been involved in. Um, I have a ongoing Exalted 2nd Edition game that has been running for, what, seven years? Five years? A long-ass time um, that plays every other Monday um, that I'm still in. Um, not much to write home about that. Uh, I'm in the Stars Without Number game to pick back up because our Fate game is currently on pause. Um, and, you know, I guess... on the shelf for a while. Um, oh. uh, it's been kind of interesting to, to jump back into characters that have been on the shelf for a while. Um, not as difficult as you might imagine. Uh, that group, that group of players is pretty tight. So, um, the the witty banter and such that made that game so much fun hasn't stopped because it's the same people playing the same characters. So I don't think that would that would change at all. Um, we have a uh, a D and D game that we've been playing in that's also on hiatus kind of right now because of people's shifting schedules. So that's you know real life gets in the way of that sort of thing. Um, I'm in. The Exemplars Nylons game. Um, I played in the Through the Breach game. 
which was interesting. Um, my thoughts on how that system worked out probably could fill a whole podcast on its own, so we'll talk about that more later, I suppose. Um, and of course, my uh, monthly Saturday, Powered by the Apocalypse Sailor Moon game, is continuing too. And that, uh, I guess we can talk about my hack of that tonight as well, if we'd like. I guess that's, I think that's it. I think that's everything. <laughs> well, um, I'm pretty boring. I haven't had any gaming. Um, I had something last month, but people got sick, had other things to do, so it just didn't work out. Um, let's see here. Uh, I, the only thing I've really been doing is getting ready for uh, the twins, getting the getting the nursery all set up and ready to go, and uh, getting all the stuff that we need to have, and it's, You've been playing the game of life. Yeah, I sure have. Um, but no, I, I'm boring. I got nothing. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and move into our uh, community love section, uh, talk about some conventions and some uh, podcasts coming up. So um, we have FGCon 7, which stands for Fantasy Grounds Convention. It's online, October 16th through 18th. Um, they're, they're, all links will be in the show notes. Uh, let's see here. We have Trident Con, which is October 17th and 18th, and that's in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, the whole thing is a charity event, and it benefits the Savannah Park Community Center. Savannah Park Community Center. Um, let's see here. Uh, Marcus shared that one with me, so uh, he'll probably be at that one. Uh, we have Tsunami Con 2015, which is October 23rd through 25th. Uh, that's in Wichita, Kansas. I only list this here because uh, I'm a fan of the podcast, Metagamers Anonymous, uh, that that is running it. And uh, Eric Carl is a pretty cool guy, so I just want to help promote him out. So if you live in the area, uh, check it out. Let's see here. Um, from last week, we had uh, Metatopia was mentioned, and that's November 5th through 8th in uh, Morristown, New Jersey. Uh, I know Monica and Henry will be there. Is that correct? Okay. Yes, I'll yes, it is. Sorry, I was trying to frantically switch back to my Hangouts window and unmute my mic. <laughs> Got you off guard. Right. Yeah. All right. And I don't want to stalk or breathe into my microphone while we're live. Uh, yeah, that would be disturbing. I'm going to try to mute it on the microphone itself and see if that helps. Okay, we'll, keep, we'll give that a try. Um, moving on, we have another online convention. It's called AetherCon 4. And that's November 13th through 15th, and that is uh, using Roll20 uh, exclusively. And um, the last thing uh, I got from David Haveka, or Havelka, uh, he is a, a longtime supporter of 1D4Con and a listener to this podcast as well. And uh, he said that Origins 2016 has put up their hotel block. And um, as of September 1st, um, event submission uh, has been open for GMs who want to run games at Origins. So uh, check that out. Uh, let see here. I have two uh, Kickstarters. The first one is Galaxy Incorporated RPG. It has 11 days to go, and it's already funded. Uh, link in the show notes if you want to find out more about that. And uh, because Henry is a big fan of maps, I included the Sci-Fi Terrain Maps. It has 41 days to go, and it's only about 55% uh, funded, but it has a long time to go, so I'm, I'm pretty hopeful that they'll, uh, they'll make that goal. And the uh, link will also be in the show notes for that. So we have um, one website comment. Does anyone uh, want to read that for us? Kate, I volunteer you. Oh my gosh, window scramble, much like Monica. Uh, okay, back between the others. Okay, from Zach. Hey, y'all. Congrats on the anniversary. 
hope that it keeps going for many more. Enjoy the episode. Learned a few things about tech that is available for campaign management. I must concur with Steve, though, that nothing replaces a notebook and pencil. One thing that my group has done recently is create a Facebook group page for each game where we can share PC and NPC picks, maps, and campaign documents. Even then, I'm the most active on the site, posting most often. I guess that's my lot in life, being the primary GM. Smiley! Anyway, keep up the good work, and I look forward to your next episode. Hey, uh, before that's pretty smart. Yeah, that, thank you, Zach. Before we go into um, the main topic, uh, we just got a Q&A from uh, Michael Daniel. He says, I have a question for each of you. What is the worst game in your collection? So who wants to start with that? I need to think about that one for a second. Uh, define worst game. <laughs> define, like, like, is that like the worst game that we own? Probably your least favorite game. Uh, like least favorite or like most pain in the ass to run? Um, game we did not have fun playing? Um, Game that is a nightmare mechanically. Like what? what <laughs> there are what many are, options. <laughs> we have many options, and I could answer one for each of those. <laughs> well, huh. a game that I bought thinking it was cool and was disappointed by. Like is that? <laughs> what yeah, is I that <laughs> More info needed. Like I don't really buy a game. Sorry, Henry. Go ahead. Henry, was, was your mic still on, babe? My mic was not on. Uh, I did not was not saying. I was waiting for you guys to get through it. Because yeah. I actually, actually kind of want to go run and look at the bookshelf. Yeah, I don't really buy <laughs> any books for systems that I hate. Normally, I try things that other people have, <laughs> and then I buy books for it, or I am gifted books for it. Hmm. I'm thinking about games in my collection. Yeah, usually, things that I've bought are things that I've already played. Um, I don't know. Yeah, that's a tough one. I, I know we have... Do we... We own a Rifts book, don't we? Yeah, we own a Rifts book. So, like, <laughs> that... That's up there. We have a GURPS book. That's up there. I own both editions of Exalted. That's up there. <laughs> I mean, I like wow. I like I loved playing Exalted, but that falls under the nightmare to run mechanically. Um, yeah, we yeah. also have Iron Heroes and and original third three point fifth edition D and D books over there too. So you know, like, um, oh, we own D and D second edition books, which I didn't enjoy playing in the slightest. Uh, mm, <laughs> Henry's over at our bookshelf looking at it. Um, I think for me, and I don't, I can't think of anything on my shelf that I don't like. I think for me, probably the shoot, <laughs> Henry. No, that's James's echo that you keep picking up. Okay, I think for me the the probably the worst, and it's probably not the worst in existence. Uh, a system that I own books for is probably D and D fourth. I really didn't enjoy fourth that much for reasons I have stated already on uh, this podcast in past episodes. I do own, I think I do own the player's handbook for it, but uh, not my favorite out of any of the D&Ds, certainly, and not my favorite out of many role-playing systems. So that's probably my worst. Yeah, okay. I mean, I think... It's, oh, go ahead, Henry. You probably have a better answer than me. <laughs> well, okay, so I went looking, and most of the games there have something, for, or something or other that I like about them, or a good memory associated with them, or something. Uh, but then I saw... So this is only stuff that I own in hard copy. Um, but I saw a copy of a book I bought a long time ago. I, I remember this, this This was bought, I think, when I was a teenager. So this was a big purchase for me at the time, which ended up being a mistake, which was the Dragon Ball Z anime adventure game by all our Ta Talsorian Games. Wow. Uh, it uses Fusion, which is perhaps an okay system. Uh, but this game... And in the abstract, I'm sure you could figure out a way to make a satisfying Dragon Ball Z game. This game, however, 
is not only unsatisfying, um, it it focuses on a very, it, it's just horrible in every way. Combat can literally get locked in infinite loops fairly simply by two, two right combatants. It's broken in all the wrong ways, and honestly, gameplay ended up being, ended up quickly being an unmanageable mess. Um, our attempts to play it when I was a teenager went nowhere. Uh, I, I was responsible for more wasted time than anything else. Uh, and the production values aren't even great. Um, and I say this as somebody who, who often likes our, our Talsarian's sort of sparse uh, black and white, sort of sparse clean line art black and white books. Um, it's, I guess, I don't know how easy it is to find now, but don't buy it ever. Um, th that is without a doubt the worst book I own a physical copy of. And that's including the Rift books. Uh, Low endorsement from Henry. Yeah. Uh, that's including <laughs> the Rift books. That's including my least favorite Dungeons and Dragons books. Uh, yeah, th th this... It, 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 it's a turd. It's a turd. I guess, like, I, that gave me a couple minutes to think about it a bit more, and I guess... I, I don't think it's entirely fair because I've never played this game, but I own um, like a core rule book for a, a Doctor Who game, and it is purely like, I don't know, the, the whole book is just geeky fan service type stuff of you can be a time lord and travel through time and all that sort of stuff. It, there's there's nothing to the rules itself that sets it apart as any sort of unique adventure that you could just probably create with a much better system. You know, heck, you could, you know, take a create your own adventure type system like Fate and go, sure, make your own Doctor Who adventure. I mean, this is, it's a game that, again, maybe not entirely fair because I haven't played it, it was just sort of a, a gimmicky money sink. So to that, I would say that is probably the worst game that I own. I think uh, I'm, I'm in the same boat with Steve. Um... Not because I hate it, but because I probably won't ever play 4th edition again for reasons. Um, and then I think my second would be Werewolf the Forsaken, the first edition, because it's just, I don't know, it, it, I, I, don't like, I don't like how they set it up. Though I am hopeful for second edition, which I'm currently reading through. Um, it has really ignited my, my love for the whole werewolf setting again, so... I plan on running that at some time, maybe 1D4Con, maybe online, I don't know yet. But uh, the first edition, Werewolf Forsaken, is probably one of the worst games I own. And D&D uh, &D 4th edition, only because I probably won't ever play it again. So. I have to say, too, about that Doctor Who thing. I did not spend my own money on it. Somebody said, hey, you like gaming and you like Doctor Who. Merry Christmas! Thanks. And then I put it away and forgot about it. You know what else we own a copy of? We own a copy of Anima Beyond Fantasy. I have enjoyed reading through Anima Beyond Fantasy, briefly daydreaming about running it or playing it, and then realizing that would be a nightmare. Yes, which is, like, I, I, I think I would put that under the category of things I got, because I think I got a spare copy from Paul because Amazon shipped him two because reasons for a steal, uh, and was like, oh, this is going to be so cool, and then realized that you have to re basically read the whole book before you can even make your character. So chalk that one up to games that looked amazing but were a disappointment. All right. Um, I think we've uh, we've answered this one pretty well. So uh, what I'm gonna, we're going to go ahead and go into our main topic. Um, we are talking about powered by the apocalypse games. So the first thing I wanted to do is I wanted to talk a little bit about the background, uh, some game info and mechanics for the original game, uh, Apocalypse World, uh, and maybe, like, what, what are the most core mechanics that pretty much get used in each of the different hacks? Because uh, all the hacks have different rules, 
but they all have the same basic core uh, mechanics. So I, that's, that's, that's kind of what I wanted to do, and then we'll jump into all the different flavors. So um, let's see here. Uh, starting, starting with the, the background here, um, it was created by Vincent Baker. Uh, he has won several uh, awards for it, uh, 2010, 2011. Um, if you don't know who Vincent Baker is, he's, he's also the creator of Dogs in the Vineyard, uh, Kill Puppies for Satan, and um, a bunch of other uh, little games um, that I'll probably put in, in the community. Uh, I, from what I understand, this game is, uh, is one that did come out of the Forge community. Um, and within the Forge community, he pretty much said, here, here's my game, hack it, make your own thing. Um, see what comes out of it. So uh, that's why this game is all sorts of flavors. So um, game info. Monica and Henry, I think you guys had the most understanding of how the whole MC thing works, so I was hoping you guys could talk a little bit about that. Okay. okay. Sure. Sure. I am hearing myself. Okay, now I'm not. All right. Um, what do you want to... What do you want me to... Know, what, what sort of angle do you want me to approach from this? Because I have emceed several games of um, Powered by the Apocalypse World in uh, in its various flavors. Um, do you want me to address basically how it's different from what I what I guess you would call standard or traditional role playing, like a standard or traditional GMing? That's what I mean. Kind of. Duties are put upon the MC that that kind of help the game flow, kind of thing, stuff like that. Um, well, it's basically running a game like you would run any other game, um, with a couple exceptions. Like I actually think the rules for um, the rules for MCing are can be followed for any game. Um, and in fact, if you read through like the things that the MC is supposed to do, it will make you a better GM of other games. Um, as let me let me reach over here and grab Apocalypse World and read you some of the things that the the MC should always do, um, which you know. Okay, so the, the MC's agenda should be make the apocalypse world seem real, make the player characters' lives not boring, play to find out what happens. Uh, always say what the principles demand, what the rules demand, what your prep demands, and what honesty demands. Um, and then each game has its own set of principles, um, which are things you should bear in mind as you're running the game. Um, in Apocalypse World, it's Barf Forth Apocalyptica. Address yourself to the characters, not the players. Make your move, but misdirect. Make your move, but never speak its name. Look through crosshairs. Name everyone. Make everyone human. Ask provocative questions and build on the answers. Respond with fu fuckery and intermittent rewards. Be a fan of the players' characters. Think off-screen, too, and sometimes disclaim decision-making. Um, and, like... Uh, Things like address yourself to the characters, not the players. Um, name everyone, make everyone human. Ask provocative questions and build on the on the answers. Respond with fuckery and intermittent rewards. Be a fan of the player ca players' characters. Think off screen and sometimes d disclaim. Decision making are are things that you can take from this and apply it to the most bog standard game of any edition of Dungeons and Dragons you like. Um, to like talk about these things maybe a little bit in in more detail, um, like to, to the the bar fourth apocalyptica thing first off, um, basically is a direction to say you know go hog wild with with the setting like the actual text from the book says cultivate an imagination full of harsh landscapes garish bloody images and grotesque just a juxtapositions. In Apocalypse World, when the rain falls, it's full of fine black grit-like toner and all the plant's leaves turn gray from absorbing it. So, like, when you're describing the background details of everything, drape them in the feel of your setting. And I think that's also, like, pretty fantastic advice for any game you're running. Um, and I guess the thing, the big thing that makes MCing different than, say, 
normal, and I'm making air quotes, GMing, is that the way the rules work, you will be responding to what your players are doing as opposed to saying, like, there is a trap. You need a 15 or higher to resolve it, that sort of thing. Um, I guess we can get into that more under when we start talking about mechanics. Um, Henry, you ran Dungeon World for uh, quite some time, and I feel like I'm rambling, so if you would please add something, if you have anything to add. Well, I think one thing that a lot of the Powered by the Apocalypse games have in common is that they come from a, a school of game design that very much doesn't want... So a lot of the games, when they try to be more narrative or allow more narrative things to happen rather than just sort of procedural gameplay, uh, they say basically, oh, well, you don't need to always pay attention to the rules or you don't always need to follow the rules to come to a result, right? Uh, they sort of, like... Uh, d most versions of D&D have s s something like that in them. Uh, that's very common in a lot of uh, a lot of uh, the White Wolf games, which is, well, you don't always need to closely follow by, by the r r rules if it's not going to be interesting. The, the school of thought where Apocalypse World comes from, and thus all the pow Powered by the Apocalypse games, is that the rules themselves should create things that are interesting, and if they didn't, you wouldn't be using them. So the assumption is in the Apocalypse World, and again, as far as I know, all the Powered by the Apocalypse games, that you that the MC or the, whatever, whoever, whatever the GM figure is called is going to be following the precepts as much as the players do because that's supposed to make these interesting situations happen. It's supposed to create, uh, cr create a, an ongoing story and see what happens. And I think that's one of the big differences between a lot of games and the Powered by the Apocalypse games. And also that, uh, this again is from a school of thought where it's important for the GM to follow these rules. Uh, like, as a GM, just because I think something's easy, I, I, if I'm running uh, Apocalypse Word, I'm not going to either, if, I'm, if, I'm, if it's difficult enough to make a move occur, I'm not going to then go, well, it should be easy, so I'm just going to give him a, a bonus to the roll. Because that would change the way the system uses, the, uses the, its mechanics to generate drama and to generate their ongoing story. And similarly, I'm not going to let an NPC escape because I want to use them later if the players, you know, have them, have them dead to rights. Because this is a game where you're trying to see what happens rather than moving it towards uh, scenes that you want to see play out. And I think for some people who are used to, are used to thinking of, sto of story games or narrative games as being uh, sort of more conducive to setting up scenes that you want to see, that's kind of jarring dra because it's sort of the opposite. Where if a player if a player goes, well, I'm I'm I, I want to kill so and so, and ha has a plausible plan and, and rolls that result, uh, the game very much is telling you as the, as the GM or the MC to go, well, that guy's dead. You know, you just rip, rip, rip rot faces face off. Uh, he's gone, uh, and that actually uh, emphasizes that in a bunch of places throughout the book that the GM shouldn't hold on to characters or things in the setting they like and think are important if the players destroy them. And I think that, and even though that might be, part of that might be a lesson that's applicable outside of the game, like Monica said, uh, it, it being so explicit in the game, is, I think, is a big difference from other games. And similarly, uh, the game I have the most experience with is Dungeon World, which in some ways has some more traditional stylings on it intentionally, but it, again, very much encourages the GM not not to try to plan out story arcs or uh, you know climaxes, but rather to let them arise naturally through play. And the rules are designed to help you get help you get there by following the rules. Um, and I think that the, the, those differences are pretty important to remember. And that any powered by the apocalypse hack that doesn't do that is probably missing a bunch of uh, some of the point and some of the spirit behind the rules. Um, so yeah, uh, I also think uh, no, another big difference is that a lot of this, what t t in my experience between uh, Dungeon World and Apocalypse World, um, the stats often are also very minimalist on the GM side. The, like enemy stat blocks are nothing like stat blocks you'd see in Dungeons and Dragons or even some, even some of the lighter games because the players are doing all the rolling. So the, stat, the GM stat blocks are basically blocks for reactions or just what the bad guy, what the 
creature or adversary or just thing is doing separately. And even compared to, like, fate, it's very interesting to see the difference between something that's designed specifically for how, what, it, what does it do and how does it interact with the players as opposed to something as something built along sort of analogous, analogous lines to the players. Uh, and again, uh, Apocalypse Ward is one of those games that very much has the that does not have the same set of rules for the players and the GM characters because it can't because the players are the ones doing all the rolling, all the rolling, and the ones that have a different sort of mechanical weight than random NPC three does. So, uh, yeah. What I read of the Apocalypse World um, MC stuff, um, there's something that they they call fronts. Uh, which is a set of th linked threats. Uh, threats are people, places, and conditions that, because of where they are and what they're doing, inevitably threaten the players' the players' characters. Uh, so a front is all the individual threats that arise from a single given threatening situation. How often have you used um, the this whole front mechanic? Uh, I'll be honest. A lot of times I'll start writing them up, and then based on the players do. Uh, sometimes they just end up n not being relevant. Uh, so I, that's one of the places where uh, I think the, the advice for fronts and how to use them is great, especially in Dungeon World, is great. But in practice, because the players have a lot of uh, control over where the game goes, uh, it can end up just... It, 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 if, you, if you build a front that's like, you know, the duke in this town is being a dick, and the, player, the players then uh, totally ignore that and decide to go hunt the Wumpus... Well, then the, the the front of the duke, if the players just get away from it, is not going to be a thing. Now, sometimes this means that the front progresses in the background. Like you've ignored the duke being a tyrant, and now he he's tax now he's taxing on the babies, you know, uh, or you ignore the you ignore the duke, and now he has he has put cats in charge of uh, the stock exchange, and m money is now worth nothing. Uh, like in, you can, in fact, you're supposed to do that. Like it tells you to think off screen. So, like if you put a bunch of fronts out there, and um, whenever I do it, I kind of abstract them a little bit. Like I'm with you on that one. That the, the front mechanic is one of those things that like doesn't get used as well as the game it sort of intends it to. Or maybe that's just you and I doing it wrong. Um, but like you put a bunch of I, I when I did that, I put a bunch of fronts out there as like here are things that are a problem and that you can engage with. Um, so, like, the Wampus is one, and the tyrannical duke and his cabinet of cats is another. Um, and if the players are like, mm, fuck it, we're going to go ha hunt the Wampus um, and ignore the cabinet of cats who are currently trying to overrun the economy with socks, um, that continues in the background. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. This needs to be a thing. <laughs> <laughs> Look what you did. Well, I, I think it's one of those things that just as a GM, sometimes players just aren't interested in an aspect of the setting. And if you as a GM have that set up to, to keep firing off when the players just aren't engaging, a lot of times in my experience that can just be a way to either kill a game or just start to lose player engagement. And I think that there's some reality at, at the table that that the sort of ideal of fronts just doesn't always uh, doesn't come, doesn't always come out because if the players want to hunt wampuses and uh, bandersnatches and uh, wolves with the heads of men and stuff and you, you built one of the fronts to be one of the fronts to be intrigue in the city and the players like out of character just don't care about that I think that trying to make that uh, accelerate in the background as a way to spur them to deal with it may just uh, end up making them enjoy the game less. Uh, so maybe that's just me missing part of the system, but I th that that's I think the place where I, I probably uh, diverge from playing it exactly by the book the most. Uh, but yeah. Do either of you have anything else you want to say about uh, MCing before we move into character creation? Mm, not particularly. Uh, only that uh, it's very easy to make enemies is, and like threats and monsters, which is something I super appreciate as a GM. I like doing it, but I hate it when it requires me to break out a calculator and to cross-reference three different books. So in both Apocalypse World and Dungeon World, it's no problem at all. And... 
I'm very happy about that, and it brings it in line exactly in line with the, the amount of prep I enjoy doing and uh, have fun doing. So sounds pretty good. All right, so uh, let's move into character creation. Um, I know uh, the only game I've ever played of the Powered by the Apocalypse is Monica's Hack, um, No Rest for the Wicked, which is based off of Borderlands. And um, I know that every uh, game using the system uses what are called playbooks, and it encourages every player to choose a different playbook. Um, do you guys have anything you want to say about playbooks? Um, maybe using them, uh, creating them. Um, Steve, Kate, jump in with your favorite ones of what you've played. I've really had any exposure to uh, Monica's No Rest for the Wicked. I yeah, same here. Run, did you run a, again a popular a bad apocalypse game for us once, James? I don't seem to recall. No, I've never ran. Okay. Apocalypse. I've read, played so many games, I have no idea. I can't even imagine how Monica and Henry process things. But um, I remember having, uh, for anybody familiar with the Borderlands series, there were... Uh, there were um, Playbooks, which which were like the character classes, sort of as I recall. Uh, com- correct me if I'm wrong, Monica. Um, that were very close to the character uh, classes, like commando and uh, and uh, was it sniper, infiltrator, uh, things like that. And they're they're kind of analogous to uh, character classes. Go ahead, Monica. I was just gonna say you crossed streams into Mass Effect briefly there, but yes, they were named after. <laughs> <laughs> I really had uh, haven't even played much Mass Effect, but um, uh, as I recall, um, it it told you up front, okay, these are your the four uh, main attributes attributes like cool and uh, I don't know Moxie or some something like that. I can't God, I can barely even remember, but. Um, they, 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 they give you these stats right up front, and they're unique to each class, but I mean, they also give you uh, um, things to choose from, little powers that your uh, character has that, uh, um, I don't know, it's just, man, it's been so long since i played it. I'm tr- trying to pull this out of my butt, but it's not really working. Sorry, I'll, I forgot. This is an explicit podcast. I'm trying to pull it out of my ass. So... Uh, no, I can't really remember. All right, I'm done blathering. Somebody else go. <laughs> well, uh, like Steve was saying, the use of the playbooks is functionally similar to a class or an archetype template, uh, but has all the moves that 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 make you make the character that kind of character. And it's one of those things where the moves aren't just like they do include like special powers and that sort of thing but they're all designed to be in line with the sort of core concept of the character and how it can have variations and sort of guide the way the character is going to be played and uh, as an example uh, in uh, in Apocalypse World the Battle Babe has a move that let, lets them pick one something to save in a, something that's going to, definitely going to survive the upcoming battle and something that's going to die and that move right there tells you a whole lot about the battle, how the battle blade works, and also what your sort of role in, in well, a, a fight or a violent confrontation is. And I, I think that what one of the strengths is that, at least in all the Power by the Apocalypse games and that, that work well, is that the playbooks are sort of constantly self-reinforcing. So that if you even if two uh, two gun luggers in Apocalypse World are different, they both they both feel very distinct a, a, as belonging to that playbook. And sim- similarly in uh, similarly in Dungeon World, uh, the the fighter the fighter moves really reinforce Dungeon World's idea of being the fighter. And you don't you don't you don't have a case like you do in latter day versions of D and D where uh, classes sort of get really spread out where uh, you have a fighting character, and while well, he might be a fighter, but that doesn't really mean anything. It's just a mechanical building block. Um, uh, so yeah, I'm, I'll let somebody else talk. Sorry. My uh, my memory is the No Rest game, and I played a Mechromancer, and the playbook gave me different options for how I can do my attributes. Like I could have my cool up high, I could have um, 
I guess, strength up high. It, it, basically, uh, it was almost like an array, and I, I could choose one one of the sets of the array uh, to decide how I want my stats to be. It wasn't a pick and choose place where you want. You kind of, I don't know if that's throughout all the other games. Uh, you can correct me if you want. Um, but uh, it also tells you what equipment you start with. Uh, the Mechromancer himself, uh, one of his things is that he has a robot. So I got to build my robot. Um, I got to... Uh, basically, it tells me um, for the history mechanic, uh, it tells me I get to choose one person and I have this history with them. Um, I choose this person, I have this history with them. And, and kind of go around the table with that. Um, and we'll, we'll get into the history mechanic in a second. But uh, the playbooks really do emphasize the arch archetype or archetype, whatever, however you want to pronounce it, um, of what you're playing. So uh, my memory is uh, Steve was playing a soldier, uh, and he was playing him very militaristic um, and uh, that kind of way. Uh, I forget what Kate was. Well, I think she was some kind of gunner or something like that. And she was just shooting everything, anything and everything. Um, I'm pretty sure Katie was a gunzerker. Gunzerker, that's what it's called. Okay. Um, I really wanted to just be crazy. Yes, yeah, she did. Uh, and she was. And it was a lot of fun. And I'll point you to both of the episodes that we recorded for No Rest. Um, if you want to listen to our crazy hijinks of failure, 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 failure. Um, it was. It was pretty hysterical. It was good stuff. It was really good stuff. Um, but uh, every game, every hack has its own playbooks, and the playbooks, in my opinion, are meant to bring out what the game is about so that the players have a guideline of how to play the character and keep the mood that the game is trying to present. Um, and that, that's, that's my thoughts on that. So I think I'm probably the only person here who's written playbooks. Um, and yeah, like, I think that's a safe bet. Yeah, I think it's a pretty safe bet. I don't, I don't, Henry, you haven't dabbled around with any of that at all, have you? I never finished one, so... Okay. Um, so anyway, um, you guys did a pretty good job of, of demonstrating the point of a playbook, which is to get the gist of a character and the archetype of that character across. Um, when I was writing the ones for No Rest, um, I was trying not to particularly encapsulate the character from the video game, but the idea of the character. Um, and in all my playtesting and in all the games that I have played for you, run for you guys on our show and at 1D4Con and in my own free time, um, that has worked spectacularly. Um, and Dungeon World and Apocalypse World are very much the same thing, where they, the, the playbooks are character ideas, they are archetypes. Like, Fighter is very much like the flavor and the idea of a fighter, because the fiction comes first, which is another really big thing in this game, where like, the, the narrative of the story is more important than, say, rolling a one. Um, and, like, progressing... Bad roles should progress the story. Um, as very well demonstrated in both of our our actual plays. Um, yeah, we kind of stretched that one. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, like, you know, wizard encapsulates, you know, the idea of this quintessential magic user. Um, and so you can... Uh, you are supposed to only have one of each in a game, but I think you could safely have two and have them still be very different characters because they are everyone's going to have a different take on this archetypal idea. Henry, would you would you agree with that? I would, and I think that the fact that uh, both your game and Core Apocalypse World, uh, rather than giving the players any like rather than letting them pick from a wide variety of powers for the entire class, or giving them total freedom with their stats. It gives them different sort of branching choices for things like this or that, or the, from, you pick from this particular list of stat arrangements. I think that's really helpful for keeping uh, lots of flexibility and sort of a big range of ways things can grow, 
while still t t t tying back into the core inspiration for the, the playbook. Uh, and I think uh, No Rest for the Wicked, because it's t tied to a, a very specific media franchise uh, w with pretty definitive starting characters, uh, <coughs> uh, does this maybe a little more obviously, but I think Apocalypse War does this, it does so in a way that calls back to how Apocalypse War, Apocalypse War works. I think it's cool. Um, I have used the same idea for playbooks um, because the idea is to sort of encapsulate the essence of a character or a character archetype. Um, for for our Sailor Moon game, um, I even, it's even more on the nose for um, Thy Kingdom Come, which is our Sailor Moon campaign, um, which I will, have, I suppose, eventually get around to putting out the rule set for the public, which its working title is, is Pretty Soldiers, um, where the playbooks are then each Sailor Scout um, and, like, even more focused than the No Rest for the Wicked playbooks because those are specifically to reflect a an actual character. Um, and I have the benefit of, like, with Sailor Moon, at least, the, the, the Senshi and the, the main characters are all pretty archetypal to begin with. They're not necessarily deep characters. Um, and uh, that, that leaves a lot of room for people role-playing them to, to bring their own flavor to the table, but also still following... Um, the specifics that uh, <sighs> that like the character needs to to still be them, and that's sort of hard coded into the playbook itself, um, and the way you earn like spendable game currency as well. Um, and if you wanted to, I think personally, if you wanted to use this system like a sort of uh, stripped down version to to make a role playing game for any sort of fandom you're in. Um, like some people really like role playing characters that they like from other media. Um, like say, let's say you're really into. I'm gonna go with Mass Effect because I referenced it earlier. Um, and you want, you really want to play in a Mass Effect game as Garrus, not as like a, a Turian number thirty five. Um, and you can, I think that you can take this system. Like if you want to play a game about being Garrus with your friends or whatever, um, and play canon characters by turning them into playbooks. Uh, and I think you can do that pretty easily, which is sort of a side effect of the way the game works, not necessarily perhaps its intention. That was a weird tangent. Let's move on. <laughs> Let, let's, talk, um, let's talk about the history mechanic, and then let's move into uh, types of moves and stuff. So um, t uh, you designed your own history mechanic, Monica, for, for No Rest and I assume for Pretty Soldiers. Um, what what is what is the purpose of the history mechanic and how have you seen it work among your groups? Henry, same question for that. Um, in Apocalypse World, it's to make the characters relate to each other and then becomes um, a stat that you use to help out or fuck with each other. Um, and when you hurt each other or help each other or you know do things with each other, your history improves um, to a point, and then it rolls over, and then you get a point of experience, and that's how you're, one of the ways your characters can grow. Um, I didn't care much for the bonds mechanic in Dungeon World. Um, it's not as evocative as history is in Apocalypse World. Um, the mechanic for history in no Rest for the Wicked is honestly based on my misunderstanding of the way it works in Apocalypse World. <laughs> I, I read it. I, I read it wrong. Um, I thought it worked a different way, and then I just copied over my incorrect rules right into, the <laughs> right into um, No Rest, but it still kind of works. Um, and I, uh, I believe in No Rest, because it's been a while since I've looked at it, it works the same way as Apocalypse World. It starts at a certain rating, it gets up to, to four, it rolls over, you get an XP, and that goes towards your advancement. Um, for Thy Kingdom Come Pretty Soldiers, um, you have only relationships, which is me taking the bonds mechanic and making it better. Um, and when you have a relationship with someone, you can evoke that to do things that perhaps you could not do otherwise, um, or get a default bonus to helping them or hindering them. And that's, that's how that works. 
have have either you had really good luck with with your games, or are there things that you just don't like about them? Uh, for uh, for the really long running Dungeon World game I had, uh, I, it generally went very well, and this, people really seemed to like the system and how interactive with things. Um, bonds, like Monica said, did seem to be a bit of an odd thing, and I think that the way I ended up using them was maybe a bit more flexible than was intended, uh, because I, I ended up making them, as time went on, a lot more uh, conducive to players making them up on the fly uh, and reinforcing them, rather than just making one for feeling it, then moving on, uh, because that sort of seems to have issues with just the way the game naturally played, but for the most part, I think that our game went very, very well. Um, I like the system a lot, uh, and I, I, I can't think of anything major I would point out as a as a flaw that kept us from having fun, or that had to be ignored, that had to be just sort of removed to have a good time. Um, so yeah, uh, I'm gonna uh, say that our experience with the rules and actual play was very positive there. Do you agree, Monica? Or? No, definitely. Um, I, <laughs> unlike pretty much every other game on my shelf, besides I don't know Fate, I can't say I've had a bad experience playing this game or any of the its varieties. That's a pretty good endorsement. Um, okay, so let's let's go ahead and move into um, some resolution mechanics, and we'll talk about different types of moves. So. In, in this game, uh, you, you always roll 2d6, and you add the appropriate attribute for the move that you're doing, and then you compare it to a table for success. If you roll a 10 or higher, it's, it's a success, uh, no complications. Uh, a 7 to 9 is a partial success, but you then um, have either, with that partial success, you have some kind of minor complication or you could have uh, just hard choices in general to deal with. Um, and then six or less, the GM gets to make a move against you, the, the character. Like, um, like in No Rest, um, I was attacking someone, I rolled a six or less, and they ended up shooting me instead of me attacking them kind of thing. Um, but uh, the one thing that I really like about this game, uh, the uh, the Powered by the Apocalypse, is that it has a fail-forward kind of mentality to it. Now, obviously, if you roll a 6 or less, you, you, you fail. But um, the 7 to 9 is a fail-forward kind of thing. Yeah, you failed the roll, but you didn't fail bad enough. You still accomplish what you want to do, but then you either get a minor or major hindrance attached to your move based on um, what you've done. So... It, what do you guys do? You guys like that that uh, that mechanic? How that works? Have you run into any issues with that? Um, with the various moves? I think the biggest issue is getting people to understand how it works at first. Uh, like when they start at, first start playing or at a one shot of the convention. Uh, a lot of times people are used to easy actions being easier, you know, and having a different target number, uh, or they're used to. Uh, d results being a binary failure or success or nothing happening on a failure rather than something bad happening. Um, I think that, that that can occasionally be a big stumbling block when people realize, oh, if I mess this up, that means the GM gets to, gets to hit me with a whammy. And some people just have a pro problems get, understa understanding or getting used to that given how different it is from other games. Um, that being said, so generally I really like it. I like the fact that there are, are almost no dead rolls where nothing interesting happens. Um, and also because uh, be, because there's no way out of what happens in a six or lower being being uh, up in the air. It means I think that in some cases it stops there from being so much PC decision paralysis. Whereas in some cases, some games, people will try to make a big complicated plan to avoid any negative effects of something from going on. Uh, a lot of times this happens in Shadowrun or other games that encourage, encourage planning. I've noticed that in, at least in my experience, in the, in the uh, Powered by the Apocalypse games, people have liked to eventually just go, okay, this, this, we, ha we know what we want to do. Uh, <laughs> six and lower results happen, so that might happen. But it's because they know that's in 
just a possibility. Uh, it usually, avo- I've seen less overplanning in a, in Powered by the Apocalypse games than I have in some other systems. Uh, would you agree, agree, Monica, or do you think that's overstating it? Uh, no, that sounds pretty much spot on. Um, I think it avoids. You, I think you covered the bases. Like it avoids decision paralysis and like over planning. Like I don't sometimes. I think the Dungeon World game kind of got a little over planning sometimes, but it was l- more like, what are we gonna do? Like how are we gonna solve the problem? Not like how can we leverage everything to our advantage because the result of how this is gonna. You, you can never stack so many bonuses that it like becomes a a pass immediately. Does that make Does that make sense? <laughs> Am I stabbing in the right direction here? I think you are. Uh, and because the, because the system is relatively straightforward, there's not a lot of people scraping for bonuses or trying to m- make big, complicated, mechanical uh, machines, basically, to get things done, uh, which, which is nice. Uh, and sometimes, uh, if, if, you're, if you like system-heavy games, that have a lot of different moving crunchy bits and different resolution mechanics in, in it. Uh, I would say the Powered by the Apocalypse, Apocalypse system will not give you that. Uh, ev- just about everything's tied into the central uh, resolution mechanism of 2d6 plus stat, uh, for, uh, and a 10 plus is a success. 7 to 9 is usually a success with a but, uh, or success at a cost, and then 6 less being uh, something done gone wrong, uh, but if you're not that kind of person, I think the I think it works really well, and uh, and and again encourages people just to if they if they know what they want to do to just try to do it rather than trying to figure out a way to not get mechanically screwed. All right, um, let let's move into moves. So you have basic and you have advanced moves. Um, basic I understand are moves that everyone can do. And then advanced are um, moves that are uh, playbook specific and uh, obtained through experience expenditure. Is that correct? Wait, what? What about it? Um, basic moves are basically moves that everyone gets. Advanced are. Oh, yes. Basic moves are the things everyone can do. All, all player characters can do them. Um, and I would even argue that they kind of take the place of skills. Um, because at least like in Dungeon World, there's like a notice shit move, and um, attacking is covered under a basic move. Um, uh, discerning someone's intentions is covered under a basic move, and so on and so forth. Um, so like, Apocalypse World has no skill list, but it does have basic moves. I think I, I think I messed. Up. My mic is all. Um, <laughs> yeah, I couldn't hear you there. You drop it. Okay. Um, I think I was clicking. Um, so what I was asking, I think that advanced moves are labeled specific and. Uh, oh yeah. Um, moves outside of basic moves or like special moves inherent to the game, um, are uh. Like basic moves are things everybody can do. They're kind of like your meat and potatoes or your 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 skills or whatever. And then you have you have special moves, um, which are usually conditional. Um, like the roll to avoid dying in Dungeon World is a special move. Um, and obviously that's not that is something everybody can do, but is not something everyone is going to try to do on a regular basis. Um, and um, then you have your playbook moves, which are what your class specifically can do that nobody else can do, and then you have advanced moves, which are like your the higher level stuff for your for your class. Okay, I, I think one of the most controversial things that come out of this system are what are called the, the sex moves. Um, how often have you guys used these? Um, what what exactly do they do? My understanding is that um, when you use a sex move. Um, on a specific playbook, 
it has a different result for each playbook. Is, is that true? In Apocalypse World, yes. Um, in Apocalypse World, you are encouraged to fuck each other, um, which builds your history, so it has um, a, a, an actual baked-in mechanical benefit, um, and then like other stuff happens when you do that. Um, and it's usually to your benefit. Um, and the Apocalypse World text um, does not specifically say that your interaction with another character has to be explicit and on screen, just that, you know, you hooked up. Okay. Um, okay, let's let's move into the different types of hacks. Um, I mean, if you have a you have a favorite one that you want to talk about, I know we've talked about um, no rest, and we've talked about uh, dungeon world. Uh, if you want to elaborate a little bit more on what these are about, uh, go ahead and do that. Uh, but I want to quickly go through all these different hacks I have listed here. Uh, Dungeon World is the one I have the most experience with, and I think that in some ways it's the furthest away from core, uh, core power by the Apocalypse game, because it takes a bunch of things from Dungeons and Dragons, basically, and reports them over to the system, like ability scores, uh, spells, and that sort of thing. Um, and so I think it's a good bridge game for people who like sort of uh, old, old school fantasy role playing but want to try something with fail forward mechanics or with uh, or, or just w with the power by the apocalypse system um, there are I ha have heard people say that because it's a less faithful adaptation of the rules uh, that it has uh, it has some design decisions that are basically tradition based uh, like why it ha why it has ability scores rather than just using the modifiers that sort of thing which I think is a, is a fair criticism but uh, it, it's very much for uh, being a, a group of, of adventurers going into dungeons or into the wilderness, stopping threats, getting treasure, and kicking butt. Um, so so I I if you want to run a campaign about like courtly intrigue or uh, uh, to, like, about courtly intrigue or about uh, wizards in a tower researching spells, this is not the game for that. Uh, it's, it knows, it's, it, but it's, it, it's it's still flexible enough that it works equally well for going into a dungeon, punching at orcs and taking their stuff, or exploring the wilderness and, and running from wampuses. So, uh, I uh, like it a lot. To, to add on to what you were saying about uh, that not being the game for that, there is a hack that is for that. Uh, it's called the Sword, the Crown, and the Unspeakable Power. Uh, and it was created by uh, uh, Will Tree Press, which is uh, made up of many of the members of the Jank cast. I'll put a link to their um, their Facebook page so that you can get updates and stuff from that. And I, I haven't been able to find an actual download for it, but I'm sure if you look around enough, you probably will. Um, the way they they say is it's it's a lot. It's like a dark fantasy um, kind of. Uh, setting uh, with political intrigue, almost like a Game of Thrones kind of setting. Um, so it, it, it's encouraged to backstab each other and, and do all that kind of stuff that uh, that you wouldn't be able to do in Dungeon World, but you can now now you can do in this. All right. Um, Really, the only hacks of Apocalypse World that I've played have been Dungeon World and the ones that I wrote. So, I, you know, I don't have a, I don't have a whole lot of, opin of opinions on these other really cool games that are out there. Well, you ran a bunch of Apocalypse World itself, so you want to talk about that? Um, sure. Um. Well, try try and keep it kind of brief. I mean, why don't we get through the list of other things that are out there? Just. Okay. Just to put to put them out there because this is a it was supposed to be a comprehensive sort of review show, so may as well. Yeah, this list is not totally comprehensive. I'm sure I'm missing a few, but I did kind of scour the interwebs and I found a whole bunch of different things. So 
I'll just kind of go through it, and uh, you guys can kind of chime in thoughts or whatever you've heard, anything like that. So um, we've already talked about Dungeon World. And I just talked about Scott. Uh, but I also found one called Ghost Lines. It is like a punk kind of Ghostbuster thing. I think that's pretty cool. Um, and I'll, I'll have a link for all of this stuff. So, uh, monster Hearts. They need monster drama. Uh, usually set in a, in a high school setting. Um, another game. James, are you, real quick, are you, like, moving your mouth away from your microphone or something like that? Could you keep, like, going in and out a little bit? No, it's it's my my stupid mouse. It, I, I'm hovering over the mute. I need to stop hovering. Can you hear me? It's really spotty, man. How about now? I mean, you have to talk long, right? It kind of fades in and out as you talk through long sentences. Okay, I, I will try and be a little bit better about this. So what did you guys hear me say? Um, something about Ghostbusters. Okay. <laughs> Ghost Lines is the steampunk Ghostbuster. And uh, I'll, put show no- I'll put a link in the show notes for this. Um, I also found, uh, well, everyone has heard of Monster Hearts, which is a teenage monster drama, usually set in high school kind of, teen, uh, kind of setting, and has very uh, can have very adult uh, things to it, as characters are encouraged to um, get with each other. Um, then there's also Monster of the Week, which is uh, pretty much like a, like a Buffy the Vampire Slayer kind of thing. Every, every uh, game you play, it's a new monster kind of set up. Um, uh, like supernatural stuff like that. Um, then we have No Rest for the Wicked, which Monica has talked about. Uh, I'll have a link to the PDF for that. Uh, Saga of the Icelanders, which is uh, basically set in the Viking era. Um, the Sprawl, which is a, a cyberpunk. Um, I'm not too sure if it's more like Shadowrun or if it's more like Cyberpunk 2020. I haven't had a chance to kind of go through. Uh, I was part of the Kickstarter, uh, so I do have access to the documents, but I just haven't had the chance to go through it. So I don't know how much magic or psychic ability is involved in this. Um, The Spirit of 77 uh, basically takes movies like Dolomite uh, and Shaft and kind of puts the players into those kind of roles. Sounds awesome. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Let's see here. Uh, I already talked about the sword, the crown, the unspeakable power. Uh, Tremulous, which is a Call of Cthulhu themed uh, game. Um, the playbooks kind of put you in the uh, like, kind of like the classic um, antiquator and all that kind of stuff um, for for that kind of thing. Uh, let's see here. I got uh, World of Warhammer. Um, Streets of Marienburg. This one I didn't even know existed until I was scouring. And it's basically set in the old world empire and uh, par- characters play Warhammer characters in the streets of Marienburg. So I'm, I'm actually kind of interested and I might read that one a little bit more. Um, this one, next one kind of threw me off and I think I think uh, of anybody who is uh, in our gaming group would want to play this, probably be Brian. Uh, world, uh, uh, worldwide wrestling RPG. What? Real? I know. It's supposed to be really good, actually. Yeah. Um. All right, get Brian. We got to make this happen. <laughs> and, and then the last one I have is um, Worlds in Peril, which is a superhero genre uh, game uh, using this powered by the apocalypse. So. Um, Based off of that, uh, any thoughts, comments, anything you want to try uh, before we wrap this up? Uh, did you mention Night Witches? I did not. Tell us uh, about it. Okay, uh, this is a game I picked up uh, at a game store I like, um, but it's a really fo- one really focused on playing uh, 
an actually historical group of female pilots in the Soviet Army during World War II. Um, and it's focused around both uh, doing bombing raids against the Germans and dealing with living in Soviet Russia and trying not to get executed for treason or uh, or for you know get, getting berated by your commanding officers for uh, being unwomanly. Uh, and it's re really in depth, and it's a really interesting, serious game. I don't know if I'll ever have a chance to run it, but I think that it is a very, very cool, very unique product, and uh, it's not too expensive. Uh, so I re really recommend picking it up if you like weird, uh, well, really well thought out games. Any other thoughts? I think I need to make that wrestling game happen. Yeah, I think that might be a thing to do. Yeah, yeah that might be a good idea. <laughs> if we can find it, that might be pretty fun to play on the show. I actually got it through Bundle of Holding, uh, Powered by the Apocalypse Bundle, so I, I, mean, uh, I got that. Wow. Need like luchador masks and everything to actually get together and play that. Is this like, <laughs> like is it like wrestlers saving the world or is it just you role play out wrestling matches or something? I think you just role play out wrestling. I mean the whole thing's like a soap opera. Thing is a soap opera. All right. Uh. Wrestling is a soap opera for men. Well, yeah, 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 but I was gonna say it's kind of scary because they're. We I did something similar to this in college. At least the people I lived with did. I mean, they had the Edinburgh Wrestling Federation. This was when one of the, I don't know which particular PlayStation game was really big. They would get together in my apartment Monday nights and have their characters they created that they've spent the whole week sending out storylines about and have their matches Monday night before Monday Night Raw they would probably play this game. <laughs> sounds like a sounds like a fun time. All right, so uh, a bunch of losers. Any other thoughts on uh, on this list? Uh, anything you want to add? Otherwise, we'll uh, we'll close out. Hi, you know, I don't think I have anything else to add besides that we gotta we should find this game and and play it on the show. But, I mean, I guess I could I could end with a ringing endorsement, as this is one of my favorite systems that I've encountered, and thoroughly enjoy running, hacking, and uh, playing. I gotta say, Monica, like as we've been going through this, I've been reading your No Rest for the Wicked playbook again, and it really kind of makes me want to play this game again. Yay! It's been too long. <laughs> <laughs> I must gun zerk everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, um, you can always uh, contact us uh, through our email, 1d4cast at gmail.com. You can always leave a comment on our um, uh, the show itself. Um, this will be on YouTube, so you can leave a comment there. Um, I will strip out the audio and put it into iTunes so that we, uh, so listeners don't have to go to YouTube to listen to it. And, um, yeah, uh, catch us on our Facebook and uh, Google Plus communities. So um, without further ado, um, good night, everyone. Thanks for being here. Thanks for listening to us. It's been a pleasure. Good night. Good night, all, and good night. Good night, good night everybody. Good night. Good night. You can visit 1D Forecast and the rest of the DVD20 media family at dvd20.org. You can provide us feedback by either leaving a comment on this episode at 1dforecast.dvd20.org using the contact form also located there, or by emailing us at 1dforecast at gmail.com. You can follow us on Facebook, Google+, Twitter, Stitcher Radio, rpgpodcast.com, and more. Just visit our website to learn how. The theme song is Dungeon Master by Platinum Butterfly. 1D Forecast is released under a Creative Commons Attributions Non-Commercial Sharealike 3.0 US license. Thank you for listening.